Silence is not a word that describes our God. God is a God who speaks. Silence can describe every other God, but does not describe our God. Go ahead real quick to Psalms. Keep your finger here. And if you're using our uh, few Bibles, uh, Exodus 20 is actually page 57. So go with me to Psalms if you can, if you will. 115. Looking at, starting at verse 4. The psalm says here, he says, Their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths, but do not speak. Eyes, but do not see. They have ears, but do not hear. Noses, but do not smell. They have hands, but do not feel. Feet, but do not walk. And they do not make a sound in their throats. In other words, these false gods and these idols are silent on every level. They don't speak and they do no action. They are so utterly useless, so utterly worthless that they can't even clear their throats. But that does not describe Yahweh. Silence is not a word that describes our God. Even when, when we think that he's silent, when he seems silent, he isn't silent. Even when we think that he is doing absolutely nothing in our lives, he is still at work in our lives. John Piper says this, he says, God is always doing 10,000 things in your life. And you may be, and I think that's the key word, may be aware of three of them. He is always at work. Al Mohler, he, said, he wrote this, he says, The creator of the universe, the omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent Lord, chose of his own sovereign will to reveal himself to us. Supreme and complete in his holiness, meaning nothing and hidden from our view, God condescended to speak to us and even to reveal himself to us. Hence, when we read the very first verse of Exodus chapter 20, and God spoke all these words, saying, we see that he is a God who speaks. And in this instance, he is not using a go-between. He's not using Moses here. Moses came down the mountain in order to tell the people, to remind the people, hey, remember, do not come near the mountain. Don't even, don't, don't even, don't step on it, don't touch it, don't even come near it. You need to stay away. That's what, you know, just reminding them, right? And then he's supposed to go and tell Aaron, hey, Aaron, you need to consecrate yourself, get yourself ready. We're going back up, we're going to talk to God. And so as Moses comes down the mountain, he's about to remind the people of that God just all of a sudden speaks. speaks to everyone. It's a voice that the people as a whole, every single one of them, heard it. Nobody that was there did not hear his voice. But many of us wish that would happen again. In fact, probably if every single one of us, if we were honest, we would probably admit at some point in our lives we wish we could hear the audible voice of God. That he would speak through all that thunderous noise of life right into our ears and say, this is my will. This is what I want from you. This is what I have planned for you. We want to hear that. We're not the only ones that wanted to hear that. Elijah wanted to hear that. But that happened once. On Mount Sinai. When Elijah wanted to have that experience, right, we understand, we remember how he, he had just killed 400 prophets of gold. The people had killed 400 pro prophets of gold. No, prophets of Baal. I don't know where gold came from. Killed the 400 and, and, and so prophets of, of Baal. He had already killed them, and, and he was waiting for revival to, to break out. I love, if you haven't ever heard Ligon Duncan's sermon on this, you need to get online and hear Ligon Duncan's sermon. 
about this, but, but he was then told that he was going to die. Jezebel says he's going to die, and so he runs away, scared to death, and God takes him to Mount Hor, this very same mountain that Moses is on, Mount Hor, Mount Sinai, and he takes him there, and he says, Elijah, come on out. And Elijah stays in the cave, doesn't come out. And there's a, 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 an earthquake, there's a, there's a wind, a mighty, mighty wind, but God wasn't in that wind. And there's this earthquake, and God wasn't in the earthquake. And there was fire, but God wasn't in the fire. It wasn't until those things had passed by that God spoke. The exact same experience that Moses had with the fire and the wind and the, and the rumblings and the, and the earthquakes and everything was happening, but there was no voice from God. He wasn't in it. It happened once. So I want to remind you of this. I want you to, to remind you that God speaking in such a dramatic way has rarely ever happened. And I want to remind you of what Hebrews says, the writer of Hebrews says. We talked about this last week, and we'll say it again. Just to remind us. Long ago, this is chapter, uh, chapter 11, verse 1 and 2. Long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our Father. I'm sorry, chapter 1, not, verse, not chapter 11. I don't know where that came from. Long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed heir of all things, through whom also He created. So while God may have spoken to the people through the prophets before, and, and while there is this one time that he was so dramatic in how he spoke, speaking with fire and, and, and rumblings and, and earthquakes and, and lightning and, and smoke, he got to speak through his one son, his only son. There is a difference. When you understand that, as dramatic as that was, and how he spoke to the people and how he spoke to Moses, as great as that seems to have been, it is much greater to have the Son come to speak. There's a vast difference between sending a servant and sending his Son. All the pomp and circumstance was not needed when he sent his Son to speak. The Son is considered to be the fullest expression of God since he is in fact God. He is the Word of God made flesh. So this God who speaks and has spoken through His Son, the one who communicates His will, has given us that will through Ten Commandments. So as we look at the first one this morning, my hope is that we all keep in mind who this God is. He is the God who speaks And so the first commandment that he has spoken, that he has communicated to us, is to have no other gods except for him. And as we study it, I want us to see three points here. One, the proclamation of God. Two, the power of God. And three, the prohibition of God. Proclamation, power, and prohibition. So if you will, please stand for the honor of God's word. Just reading three verses here this morning. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods. So in the second verse, we see this idea that God is giving a proclamation about himself, right? He says here, very first thing, in verse 2, he stated, I am the Lord your God. The word Lord here, in all capital letters, 
simply means that this is God's actual name, that he proclaims his name, that this is Yahweh. The writers uh, in the, in, uh, in, uh, of God's word, the, the Old Testament writers, the, the Hebrew writers, they, they, they would pronounce Adonai instead of Yahweh because Yahweh's name was considered to be so important, so holy as to not pronounce it. And so, so they would, when they spoke it, they would say Adonai, Lord, instead of saying Yahweh, but he is our father. And we know him intimately, so while he is holy, he is our father as well. And so, so we, we look at this and go, I am Yahweh. This is his covenant name with the people. This is who he is. And it's not just who he is, but it is also his position. I am Yahweh, your Lord. If you were to come up to me and say, who are you? I'd be like, well, I'm Chris, your pastor. Or Matt. I, am, well, I, I wouldn't say that, but you know, Matt would say that. He is that, or pastor, right? And, and so there's the name, and there is the title of who God is. His name is Yahweh, his position is God. No name was given to him. Moses didn't simply just go, well, I think we'll just call you Yahweh. In fact, he gave his name. It wasn't given to him. You remember that when, when Moses went first to Mount Sinai, we kind of talked about this a little bit last week, but when he first went to Mount Sinai to see that burning bush... He was concerned that if he went to Egypt to, to, to deliver the people of Israel out there, they're going to question him. Oh yeah, well, really? Somebody sent you here? God sent you really? Oh yeah, what's his name? Who, are, who should I say sends me? If they were to ask. Go ahead and go back, back to, to Exodus chapter 3. As God finally reveals his name, we see the name of God throughout the Pentateuch. We see it through Genesis, Exodus, and Exodus, Numbers. We only see it because Moses knew it. Because it was given to him. So verse 13 says, Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say this to the people of Israel, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. I am. Yahweh is the condensed form of the Hebrew, I am. It indicates that he simply is. He is the self-existent one. That's what the name implies. He is the self-existent one. He is the uncaused cause of all that is. So when we look in, in, in uh, 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 Hebrews chapter 1, where, where it talks about that, that the Son comes and, and the Son has created all that is, we look at him and say, he is the uncaused cause. He is Yahweh. He is Yahweh in the flesh. He is the I Am. Which is why we see that every knee will bow, every tongue will confess to his great name, that name being Lord. This is not a name that he had revealed to anybody, but to Moses. And so now, right, most of the people of Israel, people here, the I am is sent. The self-existent one has sent him. And they, they begin to follow him. Of course, there's all this grumbling and everything that takes place throughout the time. But now they are here, arrive on Mount Sinai, and they hear the thunder, and they hear the, the they, they see the lightning and the smoke and everything. They hear all this, they experience all this, and then all of a sudden, the I am is not just speaking to Moses, but the I am is speaking to the people. They hear hear that voice themselves. Moses was no longer just to be accepted because Moses said it. The people heard the voice on the mountain declare it to be so. So he is a proclaiming God. This is the proclamation of God. I am the Lord. I am Yahweh. The one that sent Moses. That's me. The one who created all things, the self-existent one, the uncaused cause of all things, that's me. I am speaking to you right now. For he was not only proclaiming his name, he was proclaiming his, his power. 
So let's go back. Verse 2 again. I am the Lord, Yahweh, I am Yahweh your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. The very one who Moses declared to send, send him to deliver the people out of slavery is now the one who is saying, yup, that's me. I did send him, and I am the one with the power to bring you out of slavery, out of the land of Egypt, out of the, out of the, the house of slavery. That's me. Who brought them out? Who brought them out of, out of slavery? Who? The I Am. What's his name? Yahweh. Yahweh brought them out. It wasn't just Moses, right? Moses isn't the one that just performed the miracles and the plagues, right? It was Yahweh. It was Yahweh who showed up as a pillar of fire and as a pillar of smoke. This is Yahweh. The one that they have been following for the last couple of months is the one who is now speaking to them. It's Yahweh who is doing this. Other gods are powerless. The other gods of the Egyptians, they could not hold a candle to Yahweh's great flame. That, that was the whole point, right, of the plagues. Every single plague was against an Egyptian god. And he made fools of them. He mocked them. He showed how powerless, how useless they were. They couldn't do anything to compete with God. Those gods of Egypt were like, like grass. And God just mowed right over them. Cut them down. Absolutely useless. Those, and not, not, not just simply that, but when he brought them out, remember, the Egyptians were so happy to see them go, they paid them to leave. We will just pay you to get out of our country. But here's the thing, we're just like Israel with Egypt. Right? Israel's relationship with Egypt, that's, that's just like we are. If we do not have Christ, they were slaves to the Egyptians, and they were, and, and we are slaves to our sin without Christ. The Apostle Paul stated that we were separated from Christ. We are separated from God. We are strangers to the covenant promises. Instead, we were held hostage by our own rebellious acts. Our own rebellious thoughts, our own rebellious words and desires. And just like the Israelites could not free themselves, even Moses could not free the Israelites, so we cannot free ourselves from our sin. It is God who must deliver us. It was the God who, it was God who had to deliver the Israelites. It is the God who has to deliver us from our bondage as well. It is imperative that the power of God work in our lives and not our own power. Look at me real quick. First Corinthians chapter 6. Sorry, in verse 9. Or do you not know? That the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, Moses tells the people that there is going to be another prophet that is going to come like him. And the people who need to listen to him. When we look at, at who that is, it is clearly Christ. Moses was the one who brought the, the, the covenants, the Mosaic covenants, 
I would call the Mosaic Covenant, right? He brought the Sinai Covenant there that was made on Sinai. He incorporated this covenant from, from God. And so now we see later on, Jesus is giving us actually a brand new covenant. Moses, by the power of God, delivered the Israelites from Egypt. Jesus is the one who delivers us from our sin. He is that prophet. And we must have him. In order to be delivered, God the Son delivering us. Look at the book of Colossians, chapter 1. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Look at verse, verse 13 and 14. He, Jesus, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness, that, that kingdom of darkness, that, that place where we were enslaved. He has, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption. And then He explains what it is, so that we make sure that we know what redemption is. The forgiveness of sins. He's the one who has delivered us from our slavery into a brand new kingdom. Go with me real quick. To Romans, go back. Romans chapter 6, verses 17 and 18. But thanks, but thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed and having been set free from sin have become slaves of righteousness out of the kingdom of darkness, the domain of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son. Yahweh has delivered us just as he delivered the Israelites. But our deliverance is secure. He is not just a powerful God, he is the powerful God. He is the all the all God. Let me go one more place. This one's not going to be on there. Just thought about it this morning. Let's go to Isaiah. Speaking, of course, and he brings out the very fact that he and he alone can save. Verse 22, to me, turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is no one. By myself I have sworn from my mouth has gone out in, uh, in righteousness a word that shall not return to me. Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall bear allegiance, or shall swear allegiance, only in the Lord, Yahweh, only in Yahweh it shall be said of me, our righteousness and strength, to him shall come and be ashamed. The Lord of all the offspring of Israel, that is us, all the offspring of Israel shall be justified and shall glory. He is the only way to be delivered. And he has sent the only one who could ever deliver us, his son. Peter says that his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called us to his own glory and excellence. It was his power not our own. Not somebody else's. Not some other religion, not some other God, not anything else. There is no other God who has ever been able to deliver anybody from their sins. His 
power of delivered us and has granted us all things that pertain to life and godliness. His power. Which gives the reason why God would prohibit our worshiping other gods. Why would we ever want to? Why would we look at God and say, thanks for everything that you have ever done to me, but I am going to go and I'm going to give credit over here. Anybody ever done something for somebody else and then they take the credit for it or they give the credit to somebody else that ever happened to you? No. God has done everything that is necessary. He has granted to us all things, all things that pertain to godliness. Right? To all things that pertain to life. And so therefore he prohibits worshiping any other gods because these have done nothing, absolutely nothing for us. These other so-called gods have done absolutely nothing except leave us disappointed and leave us broken. They haven't delivered us from sin, but have enslaved us to it. The pursuit of money has left people broken and in poverty. The pursuit of love has left people broken and feeling worthless. The pursuit of fame has left people empty and ashamed. Name a God that has ever done anything for anybody. There isn't one. Any God that people pursue will leave them empty and broken. Thomas Watson said this. He says, what we make our trust, God makes our shame. When we make our trust, God makes our shame. God would say that these people are seeking to drink water from broken cisterns. Cisterns not the exact same thing as a well, similar but not the same thing. To, that something that's dug, a well is dug down to a, uh, an underground stream that gives fresh water all the time, a cistern is dug down in hopes of catching the rainwater. And they would line it with clay or, or what have you that it would be able to hold it and not just seep right into the ground. They would get their water out of there. But of course, if there's cracks in the clay, the water seeps through. They go down and they try to bring up some water and there is nothing. It's empty. Going after any, anyone else, anything else in life other than, than God. Pursuing something with, our, with, with, with all that we are other than Yahweh will leave us empty. We have to put our hope and confidence in anyone but, but God. Notice that when God spoke, he, he spoke to you. That's the singular in, 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 uh, in, in, in the Hebrew. It's, it's singular. In case you're wondering, is he really speaking to like, us as a whole? Or is he speaking to individuals? He's speaking to individuals. Each individual was being spoken to, not the group. I am the Lord, what? Your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Who brought you out of the house of slavery. You, as an individual, shall have no other gods before me. It's very personal to God. And it has to be personal to us. It's not simply acknowledging that there is a God, like the 12 stop programs seem to do, right? There's a God somewhere out there. It just has to be whatever I want. It has to be a higher power. It's not that. God isn't saying. You just have to believe that there is a God. He's not even saying you have to believe that there is only one God. He said, you have to believe that I am God. Thomas Watson says, when we trust him, we make him a God to us. When we do not trust him, we make him an idol. Trusting in God is to rely on his power as a creator and on his love as a father. Every nation had their own gods. Egypt had their own gods. Canaan had their own gods. Rome, Greece, doesn't matter. Everybody had their own gods. 
Israel was to believe in Yahweh as God and to follow Yahweh and his instructions, worship no other God that was around them, but they would be surrounded by pagans. If I remember correctly, I don't, and maybe I'm, I could be wrong, but I don't think so. If I remember my, my Old Testament history correctly, Israel was pretty much the very first nation to ever be monotheistic. They'd be surrounded by pagans, polytheists, many gods. How easy would it be for them to go, well, yeah, let's go along and get along. I can see where they're coming from. Yeah, we can, we can let that slide a little bit. We'll, we'll, we'll go to their parties. We'll do as they do. God says, you can't. Do not do that. That goes against. I am the one who delivered you. Don't go back. We live in no less of a place surrounded by false gods. We live in no less of a place surrounded by pagans. And it is so easy to start believing and trusting in the gods that have no power. But they sound like Sounds good. Sounds sweet. Sounds believable. Nobody would call them gods, because if they did call them gods, we'd be like, whoa! Right? We just simply put our trust in those things. When we put those hard trust in those things more than we put in the name of God. And remember, remember what Tom Watson said? That which we put our, our, our trust in, God will make our shame. There's only one God who is all powerful. And there's only one God who can deliver you from your sins. And that's whether you are a believer or not. Because we believers, we still sin. This God has made himself available through his Son. Jesus said, I am the way. John 14 says, right? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the John Ray wrote this in, in 3.30. He says, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God remains on him. A person cannot have God the Father without God the Son. They're a package deal. And guess what? When you give God the Father and God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, he comes right with them. Three in one. So put your trust in the Son, and you shall have the Father and the Spirit as well. And if you've already done so, and if you have been baptized, we invite you to join and celebrate with us the Lord's Son. Celebrate our deliverance from sin. From our, our, our deliverance from the domain of darkness and transference to the that was below the sun. The bread is our representation of our, of our relationship with God. That only comes because of Jesus. And the cup represents our washing, the washing of our souls with the blood of Jesus Christ. Free from sin, 